So I come, you guys can sit on the right side. You guys come here a little. Move to the left. You, yeah, Habibi. You too. To the left. That's good. Huh? This isn't going right. Yeah, that's good. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. Last time when we came here, we were speaking. Does anybody remember what we were speaking about last time? Anybody have? Who was here last time? What were we speaking about? Is anybody from the sisters remember? Anything? One thing. Oh, very good. We were speaking about charity. Same thing, charity. Does anybody remember saying anything about charity? What is charity? Very good. So we spoke about smiling was a way of charity. It's one of the... No. Say that again. Is it one of the pillars of Islam? You have to give no. There's a word. It doesn't say sadaqah. Charity in Arabic is sadaqah. Zakat. That's different. So sadaqah, charity, is something you give voluntarily. Zakat, you have to give. It's a tax upon you. An obligation made upon you. Today's topic is a little different. This topic is about. Something that we are currently in right now. Does anybody know we're in something special right now? What is it? Dhul Hijjah. Very good. And there's so many rewards that a Muslim can attain in Dhul Hijjah. And the virtues behind these 10 days are just so beautiful and there's so much. Like I, I can name so many ways. And inshallah we're going to get into it. Of as to how a Muslim can get so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these first 10 days. And so many Muslims lack the importance of knowing what Dhul Hijjah is and the rewards and virtues behind Dhul Hijjah. And it's a shame because we tend to lose out on all of the rewards. Some people think that the best chance to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only in Ramadan. And so they forget about the rest of the months. Not knowing that, believe it or not, these first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah is better than some of the days within Ramadan. So there's like a, there's like a difference of opinion, right? But majority of them are saying that Dhul Hijjah, the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, are, gr are the greatest days of the whole year, right? So in Ramadan, we're going crazy about good deeds, and some of us are forgetting that believe, these 10 days are amongst the most beloved days to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens in these 10 days? There's something that happens that's an obligation upon us that we all have to complete. Hajj. Very good. And do we have to complete Hajj or no? Is it option? Very good. So you have to. Right? As long as you have the opportunity. No, we talked about Ramadan like five months ago. <laughs> but it's okay. How about Umrah? Do we have to do Umrah? Yeah. We have to do Umrah? How about you? No, we don't have to do Umrah. Umrah is optional. Hajj, you have to. We have, I explained it last time about. Zakat, how there's like the five walls, that's, how, that's what makes you Muslim, right? And if one of the walls is missing, you kind of break the bridge. The same thing applies with Hajj. If you have the money to go to Hajj and you choose not to go it, you're missing one pillar that completes you as a Muslim. So it's like, it's like a missing key. So these 10 days, you have Hajj, a, a pilgrimage that erases all of your sins and something that elevates you so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to make us amongst those who attend and, and, and complete hajj during our lifetime. Because hajj itself, it's, it's a whole lecture. If we go into hajj and the explanation of it, it's subhanAllah, hajj and umrah. Two pilgrimages that people like, tend to forget so much about the rewards and virtues behind hajj and umrah. Some people just think you, know, you just go to Mecca and pray. There's so many steps within hajj and umrah. And every step has an explanation. And it's so beautiful. So within these first 10 days, you have... Hajj, in which a Muslim goes and completes it. The Prophet ﷺ says that the best days of the world are the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. The Prophet is letting it known, it's a hadith. 
So this is not something said by a sheikh, the prophet, the greatest man to ever walk earth. He's letting you know that the best days in the whole world are the first 10 days of Dhul Hajjah. And they are known to be the best days to do any good deed. Like if you're going to do anything good, do it in Dhul Hajjah. Like some people, it drives me crazy, but they tend to do the opposite. In these 10 days, they, they do more sin than good. And there's a hadith of the Prophet, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no good deeds can be done at a time better than these first 10 days of Dhul Hajjah. This is the Prophet saying it. And so there was a companion that asked the Prophet, not even jihad. So we know what jihad is. When you're fighting and you're, you know, you're with your Muslim army and you fight and you die saving a Muslim country or saving your Muslim brothers, this is something that you get, you get pretty much a free ticket to Jannah. It's something so great. Some people were making, some of the companions back then, there was even a story about it, how a companion, he wanted to die as a, you know, a person who, who had committed jihad. A person who fought in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and died doing so. Because it's such an honorable exit. You sacrificed your life to protect Islam and your Muslim brothers. So this companion, he tells the Prophet, not even jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better, like this good deed, which is something so great, you literally get a free ticket of Jannah, the Prophet says, not even jihad in the way of Allah is better than the good deeds that are done in these first 10 days. So the Prophet, he's comparing something so large, like, you know, such a, a large good deed for a reason. He's trying to wake up and make everyone realize that what, these 10 days are the times you wake up, you take advantage, it's 10 days. Do as much good deeds. And I'm going to mention a couple of good deeds that we should really start doing because we're, we're already almost halfway through Dhul Hijjah. So I'm going to mention a couple of good deeds a Muslim can do and you should really take advantage because this, believe it or not, amongst these 10 days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can choose, choose who is prohibited from hellfire. There's a day. Does anybody know what day this is? What? The day of, the day of Arafah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and He makes hellfire haram on different people. Is he going to choose, like, if, if we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but think about it. If there's two people, one person who spent his nights worshipping Allah, he wakes up, he does good. He goes to the measure during Fajr and Aisha, he doesn't miss prayers, he doesn't say bad, he's doing all of this good. And then you have another person who wakes up, you know, the first thing he starts off is by arguing with his mother. Another thing, he goes and he yells at his sibling, he says bad stuff. When his mom tells him to pray, he ignores all the prayers. When his sibling tells him we should fast during the month of Ramadan, he tells him, fasting what bro, I'm not going to fast. If Allah is going to look at two people, one person that spent video games all day or whatever the case may be and doing bad and another person who actually realized that, you know, I'm a Muslim, I only have one chance in life and that's to please Allah and earn a spot in Jannah that's going to last me, you know, forever for the rest of my life. So I might as well do as much good as I can. And so he does the good that whole day. Who do you think Allah is going to choose? Is he going to choose the person wasting his whole day playing video games? Or is he going to choose the person that went out of his way to give charity, to pray, to fast? Which one? That wasn't a hard question. <laughs> Which person is Allah going to choose? Very good. The person who's doing good. Spending more good. So that's why I tell people, if you're going to waste time, like, because I like to have fun. There's no, there's no problem with as a Muslim having fun, right? And going out, whatever, hanging out, chilling with your family. Everybody loves to do that. But if you're going to spend any of your time doing that, do it outside of these important days, the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. Like you have 365 days of the whole year. Take out 45 of them if you can. Four, 30 for Ramadan and these 10 for Dhul Hijjah. So, sorry, 40 days, and just take advantage and worship. And the rest of the days do your regular ibadah and you don't have, but, but focus in these 10 days about getting a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's the easiest times to get close to Allah. Allah subhanahu, another, another important virtue of Dhul Hajjah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears about it in the Quran. You know when Allah swears about something in the Quran, it's like, you know, up there. Allah doesn't swear about something except that He's trying to tell us, you know, wake up. Don't forget about it. And the reason why I'm mentioning this, because I was going around the other day, I'm asking, like I was in the measure, I was just asking people, yo, what's Dhul Hajjah? Oh, he doesn't, doesn't know what Dhul Hajjah is. What do you mean? Where are we in? He goes, I'm in Sha'ban. <laughs> I'm being serious. He doesn't know, he doesn't know what Dhul Hajjah is. I'm like, bro, you don't know what Dhul Hajjah is? What's some good stuff we can do? Pray, you know, whenever I have time. I'm like, bro, you're, you're missing out on these tenor words. And I just started mentioning. You know, we just started talking about it. He goes, I didn't even know about that. And you see, and that was one of my lectures, learning about Islam. If you don't go out of your way, the same way you learn about school subjects, if you don't go out of your way and learn about Islam, you're never going to know stuff like this. 
And we mentioned last, last, last lecture, why the shiuch and people that are so close to Allah are so happy. It's because they went out of their way to bring this happiness to themselves. They discovered ways of getting close to Allah, the creator of happiness, and they did the actions that pleased Allah. And so in return, Allah said what? Well, you know, you, you, you went out of your way to please me and get a connection with me, so I'm going to give you satisfaction, happiness, you know, success. This is, this is the connection between your law. Instead of you ignoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and wondering why am I depressed? Why am I annoyed? Why do I hate life? This is, this is true. You're missing. You're, you're, you're depressed because you're getting away from the, the person, the Lord. Sorry, not the person. The Lord that is the creator of happiness. So many, so many people. I'm depressed. I'm sad. I'm annoyed. I hate life. It's because you're getting away from the one source that provides and what makes life happy. If you're away from him, how do you expect? If you're doing actions that are bad and keeping you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, explain to me how can you get happiness or, or live a life that pleases Allah. Some of us, when we do something bad to, to bother our parents, we feel regret. And we come back and we apologize to our parents. Why? Because we know we did something wrong. So we go back, I'm sorry, mom, I did. And you, you know that if your mom is upset, your whole day is ruined. Me personally, if I know that. If I know my mom is upset, I'm not going to be happy the rest of my day. I'll go, I'll buy flowers, teddy bear, I don't even care. I'll just buy, just to make her happy again. Because nobody's going to be happy if, if your mom is sad. You know you did something that messed up, and now your whole day is ruined. The same thing applies with you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to well, live a good life, be happy, not always feel annoyed, keep your connection with Allah good. And dul hijjah is one of the best ways to what, wake up and, and you know, start doing this. So Allah swears about it in the Quran. He says, well, fajr wa layalin ash. So He swears about it. Allah, and He continues the surah. The 10 days of dul hijjah. And another important virtue, we mentioned it, was what? The day of Arafah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he says that there is no day on which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets more slaves from hellfire than he does on the day of Arafah. There is no day that Allah makes people come out of hellfire, like he, he, he forbids it khalas, on them, except on the day of Arafah. So people are freed out of hellfire on this, on this blessed day. And people are also attain, you know, they get written, this person is going to enter Jannah from the good they do. It all depends on what, what good deeds, Allahu Alam. And these are gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, depending on how you're living your life. Perhaps Allah makes rates sound that day that you did something good, something as simple as, I give the example of the woman that you know, fed the dog and she wasn't even Muslim and Allah wrote that he's, she's going to enter Jannah. Something so simple, but Allah did it. You never know this can be you, just by doing something so small and good. So what are some stuff we can do in Dhul Hijjah? that can make us get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, obviously, it's, it's probably the most important one, and it happens during this time. What is it? We mentioned it already. No. No. Hajj. Very good. The obligation upon you. Hajj. If you can do this, it's the best thing you can do in these 10 days, because it's, it's, it's the way... We're almost done. He wants to go to the bathroom. Yeah, we're almost done. So completing Hajj, this is an obligation, right? What's, what's the number one thing you can do, if you can do it? Oh, well, well, I said it like seven times. Obligation upon you. Five pillars of Islam. <laughs> what else besides prayer? We just said it. <sighs> hajj, mashallah. So if you can do Hajj, this is a great thing. If you can't do Hajj, I'm going to show you right now how to do Hajj and Umrah without going to Mecca or Medina. Once again, people who you know, didn't go out of their way and research this probably would have not known it. How to do Hajj and Umrah without even going to Mecca or Medina. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, whoever prays Fajr in congregation. So he goes to the Masjid, he prays Fajr. And then he sits and remembers Allah until the sun rises. So you're in the masjid, you pray Fajr, and after Fajr, you're sitting there, you're reciting Quran, or you're in a lecture, whatever it is. You're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after a while, he prays the two rak'at. So when the sun comes up, they call it shuruq, you pray the two rak'at, the Prophet says he will gain a reward equal of making perfect umrah and hajj. Like the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a hadith like this that just make me go crazy. Like subhanAllah, it's, it's just, it's so beautiful how our religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it so easy for us to get close to Him and we still go out and, you know, don't take advantage of it. And we were speaking last time, like on that day you can't say, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I didn't have time or I didn't know. 
or you know there was, there was no there was no time for me to go do this or no time for me to go on, on that day like all your deeds and actions you did it's it's over it's like a test when you finish whatever your SATs and you got your grade you can't try to contact college board and tell them I want to go back and change a couple of answers it's done whatever you got on the SAT it's it's done so whether you did the extra studying before it whether you hired a tutor whether you stayed after class whatever the case may be that grade you got is the grade you're going to get and same thing applies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his judgment. If you don't take advantage of good deeds like this, how do you expect on that day for you to try to change your outcome? What, you, you shouldn't be looking forward to a day where you, know, you, you try to come back, you know, like a, a, another outcome. Or maybe on that, because some people, what they do is they underestimate the day of judgment. And it's because they don't see the reality of it in front of them. They don't see hellfire and jannah and everything in front of them. When they do... Everybody's scared, but it's going to be too late. But what happens is this is how the mind is. When they don't see, when you don't see a punishment in front of you, you're going to commit a sin, right? If a Muslim right now was alive and Allah, for example, was to put hellfire in front of us, before every time you commit a sin, you were to see hellfire, would we ever commit a sin? Of course not. It's right there. You're going to be going crazy. But the reason why we don't have this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to test our faith. So he leaves it on the day of judgment for where for those who were able to restrict themselves and remember Allah without having to be shown visible proof, those are the ones that are going to be protected from it. And those who did good, remembering that there's a day that they can enter Jannah, those are the ones that are also going to enter it. So you're going to be protected to enter. But what? By keeping your iman high and remembering at those moments what your goal is. Before any sin, before anything bad, that you want to be protected from hellfire and entering Jannah. So, a simple way of doing good deeds. Hajj and Umrah. Praise two rakat and Fajr. It's going to take like, what, 30 minutes staying in the masjid? 40 minutes? I promise you, the World Cup, that series, it was like, we, were, we would watch two games. And the game was like 120 minutes. So it was like four hours. We would watch and we would even watch the rematches just for fun. It was like seven hours. 45 minutes, you wake up, go to the Medjid, pray Fajr, watch how your connection with Allah goes crazy. Or even if you're at home, pray it with your family. Wake each other up, pray it. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are ways that you show Allah that you care about entering Jannah. Another good deed you can do, the Qur'an. One letter in the Qur'an is worth how much? Ten. So if you recite a page... And once again, th the reason why I'm bringing up all of these good, I'm trying to like put in your minds how many different ways we can do good because the hadith says it. There are no better day, 10 days, there are no better, no better days than for you to do good except in these 10 days. And we're almost done with them. And you don't want these 10 days to pass by and I should have wished, you know, I, I, I did more good. You don't want that feeling. It's always better to not feel regretful than to feel regret. It's always good to do more than to do less. Because the feeling of regret is worse than the feeling of you doing too much. I, I promise you that. You're, it's, it's a terrible feeling that you feel regret. Especially some people, they say already, when Ramadan ended, the most thing I was hearing, I wish I would have done more in Ramadan. This is your time. These days are equal or even better to the days of Ramadan, as the scholars mentioned. So the Qur'an, one word, one letter, is 10. So reciting a word, four or five letters, that's like 50. Keep doing it. Recite a page, half a page, listen to it if you don't want to read it. Listen to it when you're going back and forth. If you go to the gym, listen to it in the gym. If you're in your car or whatever, you're with your parents. Recite to them before you fall asleep. Simple stuff like this gets you close to Allah. Fasting. Fasting is a big one. And the companions of the Prophet, they used to fast these 10 days, 9 days. They used to fast them. Why? Does anybody? There's like a huge reward behind them. Does any? Does anybody know the reward? We, we talked about this like last year. Mm, mm, no, there's another hadith. What happens if you fast? Just in general, if you fast or something. Okay, yes, you get hasnat, of course. You get rewards, of course. Does anybody know what happens? So for anybody that fasts for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one day, Allah removes his, his face 70 years away from hellfire. So he puts a, a distance between your face and hellfire, a distance of 70 years. So 10 years, just imagine, is crazy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts it 70 years. So if you're fasting 9 days, multiply that by 7, 9, 7, 9, 18, 
MashaAllah. <laughs> 630 years. Just by what? Fasting these what? Nine. Nine days. So take advantage of fasting. What does fasting do? Very quickly. What does it do? Would you more likely do bad when you're not fasting? or? You what is the likelihood of you doing bad more fasting or without fasting? With fasting or without? Without fasting. Why? Very good. Because you're, mashallah. <laughs> because you're fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more when you're fasting. You, you automatically restrict yourself. This is why it's one of the best things to do fast. Whenever your iman is feeling low, you fast. It restricts you automatically from doing anything bad. Because you're remembering that you sacrificed your food, your water, for the sake of Allah. And it automatically convinces you to do more good. So fast in these nine days. We have a couple more. The night prayer. Praying at night. And mind you, these are extra stuff. If you're not praying your five daily prayers before these, I don't know what's... You have to wake up. I'm sorry. It's like a very bad sin. If you're missing your prayers, like this is... These are just extra stuff to get close to Allah and awarded. But if you're missing one of the five prayers... That's very bad. It's like so bad. Especially in these days. These days are, are where the good deeds are rewarded. Imagine you're trying to do good deeds and get close to Allah, but you're, you're, you're like sinning every day. Whether it's Fajr, Duhur, Asr, Maghrib, Aisha. I told you, there should be no time that affects you from praying these five daily prayers. Unless you're excused. And we know the excuses upon us. But other than that, there, there should be no reason why you're missing Salat al-Fajr. And I mentioned about Fajr. If you had a doctor's appointment, if you had a job that pays you a million dollars an hour, we're going to wake up at 5 a.m. and pray Fajr? Yes. Same thing with Aisha. Some of us sleep early just so we don't pray Aisha. It's true. We, like, we know Aisha's at 10, we, we sleep 9.30. Just because. I don't, I don't want to make it to Aisha. Don't miss any of your five daily prayers. This is like the base thing that starts the connection. Like, you know, it's like you're lighting up a match. And then the match gets to the end. When the match reaches the end, you're at your max with Allah. The match is not even going to light up if you're not doing the five daily prayers. So make sure you're praying your five daily prayers. Now the night prayer. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, whoever attends the Aisha prayer in congregation, so you pray it together, it is as if he has performed salah for half of the night. And he, he says, whoever attends the Aisha and Fajr prayer in congregation, it is as if he has prayed the whole night. So imagine that. Praying from 10 till 5 a.m. You want the reward of praying from Aisha till Fajr? Pray dumb in congregation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward you as if you stood up all night praying. Another very big deed you can do to get rewarded. So at the end, I'm going to ask you guys the different good deeds. So I'm hoping, you know, you're with me. So we already mentioned one. Which was, which one was the one about Umar and Hajj? Does anybody remember the one about Umar and Hajj? This, that, that's like a big one. No. Allah Billah. You. How do you get how do you get the reward? Yes. How how, how do you get the reward of performing perfect Umar Hajj? Very good. Perfect. MashaAllah. So if you pray Salatul Fajr in the Majid or in congregation. And then you stay awake until the sun rises, worshipping or remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when the sun rises, you pray to rakat, it's as if you performed the Umrah and Hajj perfectly. And then the second one, the Prophet is mentioning what? If you pray Aisha and Fajr in congregation, it's as if you have prayed the whole night. You worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whole night. Another one, this one's easy, making dhikr. By, see, you know... This is something you can do when you're sitting down. You don't even have to pray or nothing. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, He who recites after every prayer, SubhanAllah. Actually, no, let me actually ask this before I even say this. Why do we say SubhanAllah Hu Akbar? SubhanAllah Hu Akbar, Alhamdulillah. Why do we say this 33 times and then we say the La ilaha Allah after Salat al Dhuhr? Why do we do this? No. Does anybody know why do we do this? Does anybody know the reward behind it? I see you, brother. With that. <laughs> okay, yes, you get hasanat. So whoever says after every prayer, Subhanallah, three thirty-three times, Alhamdulillah, thirty-three times, and Allahu Akbar, thirty-three times, and then follows it with La ilaha illallah, Wahdahu la sharika la, la al mulk, la alhamdu, yuhmiyatu halakul shayin kudir. Whoever says this after every prayer, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will forgive all of his sins, even if they were as much as the foam of the ocean. 
Now try counting the foam of the ocean. You guys all saw like the submarine video where this, the five people like drowned and they were going, they were going crazy trying to find them in the, the ocean and the, like they kept searching and they just couldn't find them. Miles out, out, like it just shows you how large the ocean is. Allah is telling you that the whole foam of the ocean, if your sins were as much of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, was as much as it, he would still forgive you. As long as you uh, just said words, you just said it. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar, wal Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar. 33 times each. It's nothing hard. Do we say more bad words than we do remembering Allah? Once again, this is how you like realize your connection with Allah. Or do you say more good, de more good stuff than, than bad? This is how what a person realizes good. What did I just say, sisters? Yes. I know you know. One sec. Anything about what I just said right now? The form of the ocean. Okay, do we say La ilaha illallah wahdahu la shaykh 33 times? Okay, good. So what do we say 33 times? It's three words. And, and what? Allahu Akbar. Good. So we see those three words 33 times, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all of your sins as much as the ocean. Last one, the last third of the night. This is my favorite one. This is where the tears come out. Uh, it's just, it's like, so if you wake up during the last third of the night, the last third of the night, it is, it is a beautiful time. And I love it so much because usually it's us going and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we need something. Yes or no? When you're in need of help, when you're stressed, when you're looking for something, seeking forgiveness, aren't we the ones that call out to Allah? Yes. Right? When we, when we need something, does Allah ask us or do we ask Allah? We ask Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mashallah, and the, the last third of every night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala switches it up. He's the one that comes down and asks all the Muslims, and he does this during the last third of the night for a reason. Because he knows not any Muslim is going to wake up for the last third of the night. If you wake up for the last third of the night, know that you are special Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm being so serious. If you wake up for the last third of the night and then you pray Salat al-Fajr, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. Because in the last third of the night, there is like a blessing that Allah only gives to those he loves. Those who truly care about pleasing Him. Allah comes down in the last third of the night. Every night He says, Is there anyone asking of me? So, or like calling on, making dua to me, so that I may accept His dua. We're not calling out to Allah. He comes down to the lowest heaven and He's asking all the Muslims, Is there anyone awake making a dua so I can accept it? Automari like automatically guaranteed. Is there anyone awake? He looks. And you're not going to find Muslim Muslims knocked out except those who are trying to please Allah and get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he asked them is there anybody awake making dua so I can accept it is there anybody asking of me so I can grant his request weren't you looking for something didn't you need help with something are you asking of me at this time so I can give it to you and was there anyone seeking forgiveness so I can forgive him some people feel like you know if they, they've done so many sins that no matter what they can't get forgiven Allah is making it clear right here. If you're awake during this last third of the night, or, or leave this on the side, if you're saying this, uh, praying, saying the, the afqad after each prayer, even if you had sins as much as the form of the sea, He's going to forgive you. And even in this hadith, He's saying that if you're awake during the last third of the night, He's asking you, are you seeking forgiveness so that I can forgive you? No. Nah. Okay, so the night is divided into three parts. It starts from after Aisha, or after Maghrib. Or Maghrib, Aisha. Maghrib. So it starts after Maghrib, so that's when the night begins, and it ends at Fajr. So divide that time, it all depends where you are in the country. Sometimes Maghrib is 5, 7, 8, I think here it's like 8.30. So it would start 8.30, and Fajr is at like 4, 4.30, I think. Yeah, around that time. So you would take it, it's like what, 10 hours maybe, 9 hours? You would divide that into 3. So you divide the nine hours, which is the time between Maghrib to Fajr, divide it, that's nine hours, divide it into three, because there's three parts of the night. So after Maghrib, the first three hours, you just finish the first third of the night. So it's going to be 12, 
or no, I'm bugging. It's gonna be eleven. Sorry. Then after eleven till two, this is the second third of the night, and then from two a.m. till Fajr, this is the third of the night, the last third. This is what this is where you pray. You, you know, you, you you do your worships. You pray your your night prayers. It's the last third. Those who wake up at this time, 2 a.m. to Fajr, they start worshiping Allah. Specifically because of this hadith. Allah comes down during this time and He wants to see who, because 90% of the time you're going to be sleeping during the last third of the night. No matter where you are in the country, if you divide the last third of the night, you're going to be sleeping. So He sees who wakes up during this time and worships Allah and asks of Him that so He can accept it. Because not anyone is going to be able to do that. So at the end of the day, Dul Hijjah, is a very rewarding month. And the Prophet made it known, it's the best time for you to do good deeds. So take advantage of these 10 days, especially if you missed out during the month of Ramadan. You saw our Ramadan lectures downstairs when, when we were done with the, when I was sitting with you guys downstairs and you know some of you were going crazy. Some of you after were like, I want Ramadan to come back because you know, I probably did some, I messed up or I wasn't taking advantage or playing too much. Now is the time you can do it, right? We don't have the playing area downstairs. So you can do it when you're home or wherever it is. Even if it's five minutes of the Qur'an. Like, ask yourself, are you very, are you like so weak as a Muslim that you can't even read a page of the Qur'an every day? Not even a page, half a page? Ask yourself, do you, do you hold the Qur'an every day? Even if it's one line, I'm being so serious. The best deeds that are beloved to Allah isn't the deeds that are huge. You know, you do them all at once. It's the deeds that are cons consistent. So Allah would rather like it instead of you reading the Qur'an one day and never touching it again for the next day of the year. He would prefer that you read one line every day for the rest of your life. Because with that, you're not just doing good at once and keeping you know, a connection for one day and after that you know, it all goes downhill. With the other one, with the one line every day, you're always keeping that connection with Allah alive. The consistent deeds, remember this, the consistent deeds are what's better than the deeds that are done all at once. Now, what are some virtues or rewards that we can do during Dhul Hijjah? Or any ahadith, or something you learned today about Dhul Hijjah? Anything you learn about Dhul Hijjah? A hadith? Uh... Yes, it's question time. Go. Should I start all over again? <laughs> something about Dhul Hijjah, please. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Anything about Dhul Hijjah Something that happens in Dhul Hijjah What is Dhul Hijjah? What does Allah do in Dhul Hijjah? <laughs> Just one thing about Dhul Hijjah Okay Brothers are weak Sisters Oh see <laughs> In the back Good So the best thing you can do If you're going to do something Is Hajj It's perfect Is Hajj obligation or no? Is Hajj not... Hajj obligation or is it voluntary? Very good. So it's an obligation. You. Something you learned. <laughs> so Hajj. Hajj has. Uh, it's not. Is Hajj all done in one day or no? Very good. Hajj is done in 10 days. Another thing. Very good. So increasing in tahmeed, what, what is that? What is takbir? What is, the, what is this? Very good. So these three of God, they have their names. So takbir, tahmeed, what's tahmeed? Tasbih. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wallahu akbar. They all have the three, the three names. What's the reward if you do them? I mentioned that. If you do them after every prayer, there's a certain reward. Very good. As much, what does Allah get? The Prophet he gives us an example of what? I said to some, very good. Something else? Remembering Allah? Perfect. So if you pray the two, if you pray so two rakat in congregation, so at masjid, fajr, sorry, if you pray fajr in congregation or at the masjid, and you stay up remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you pray the two rakat when the sun rises, it is as if you've completed perfect umrah and hajj, the reward of it, without even going. Now, just a quick thing, if you did this, does this mean you don't have to do, like, perform hajj? 
Very good. What did, what did you say? How about you? No, does it count as if you did it? Like you don't have to go do it no more? It does, right? So it's as if I did Hajj and I don't have to go do Hajj no more? You stop <laughs> changing his answer like four times. Yes. So if you do it, this doesn't mean that you know your Hajj is completed. No, you have to still go perform Hajj. Something else. Go. Oh, okay, when you're awake, he, at, he already knows those who are awake. But he's, he's looking for someone that is what? Making dua so that Allah can accept his dua. Is there anything else? Something that Allah did about it. No, go. You can fast. Very good. What happens if you fast one day? Something happens. You, you in the back. Very good. So you, your face gets protected seven, a distance of 70 years from hellfire. Anything else? There's two. You can go first. You didn't do it. Yeah. Very good, yes. So he chooses a day in which, you know, he removes people from hellfire. So in other words, you know, hellfire, they're not going to enter it again. He protects you from hellfire. How about you? Were you going to say the same thing? Very good. So the hasanat, they have more barakah. But there's something else I was saying about that. There's a certain word. These, these good deeds, they're what to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They're more what? They're more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on these days. It's like, you know, he, 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 he looks deeply for those who are going out of the way and it's, it's something that's elevated in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything else? Did Allah do something about these 10 days in the Quran? What? You know the surah. I mentioned it. No. Yes, very good. Who said that? MashaAllah. So with Fajr, with Layal and Ash. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears about these 10 days. So once again, showing the importance. You. Yes, so she mentioned the hadith. There was something I said about jihad. When you, yeah, when you sacrifice yourself in the way of Allah, but there was like some, it was connected. Okay. Very good. Very good. So we know that the Qur'an is what? The greatest revelation. The Qur'an, it's, it's something so huge. It's, it's, it's very meaningful to us Muslims. It's the greatest book out there. And within it, the words of it is very holy. It's so important for us to read. And this is why we say understand the Qur'an. So if inside of the Qur'an, Allah is swearing by something, so whatever it is, He is swearing about. It doesn't have to necessarily be the 10 days, but in general, um, when he speaks about something, for example, disobeying your parents, this is something that so many people underestimate. But because Allah makes it, you know, he wants, he wants to show it to us how much of a big deal it is, he mentions it in the Quran. Don't even tell your parents, oof, he made it a whole ayah in the Quran. So when something's an ayah in the Quran, Allah is letting you know that it automatically, it's a major sin. It's something that you have to take note of. So he, he mentioned in the Qur'an to you know, open your eyes and realize, hey, this is nothing you can joke around with. He did the same thing, like you said, to make us open our eyes with the 10 days. He swears by them. Making it an A in the Qur'an, making, it, well, re making us realize that, it's important. What was about jihad? This is the last thing we'll end off with. MashaAllah, we said everything. I'm like so happy. One of the best pictures. Jihad. No, you said the definition. What happened with jihad? There was like a hadith about it. Come on, man, you got this. Very good, yes.
that's overall the hadith. There's, that there's nothing better in these 10 days, even jihad, compared to the good deeds you can do in the first 10 days. And the hadith went, is that the Prophet he was telling the companions, a companion, that there's no good deeds better you can do in these 10 days. And so a companion was like, not even jihad, because they know jihad, you're sacrificing yourself, you pretty much, you know, you died, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, protecting a Muslim country. So it's something huge, you sacrifice your soul. So he's asking, not even jihad, sacrificing yourself, is greater than the good deeds you can do in the first 10 days? The Prophet said, no, not even jihad. Not even something as so extreme as, you know, you losing your soul for the sake of Allah, is greater than the good deeds you can do in these 10 days. Any questions? So it's, once again, it was showing the importance of these 10 days. Any add-ons, questions? You wanted to say something, I'm sorry. Oh, you're gonna do it? Okay. So yeah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the end of the day, we mentioned a whole bunch of ways. You guys all now you know, have an idea of the importance of these 10 days. We have, le I think, like six days left of the hajjah. Take or, or less. Uh, take advantage of these next days. If you can fast, fast. Uh, if you can pray the extra prayers, wake up in the last third of the night. If you can recite more Quran, one letter is 10. Recite a page every day. Get used to doing it. Make it like a homework assignment. I promise you after you finish doing it, which is going to take like a minute, you're going to feel more happier and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nah. Of course, recite any surah. Surah Al-Mulk, recite Surah Al-Ikhlas. If you, if you recite Surah Al-Ikhlas one time, it's as if you read one third, you completed one third of the Quran. If you recite Surah Al-Ikhlas, you, you're reciting it one time, so, كُلُهُ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Allahu Samad, Lam Yadu Lam Yurud, Wa Lam Yakul Lahu Kufuun Ahad, making the intention of re receiving the reward of the, the hadith, which is what you recite, uh, you get the reward of you reciting one third of the Quran. So if I made that intention before I recited it, you, I just got the reward of reciting one third of the Quran. So I'm gonna say it three times, because now it's gonna count as if I recited the whole Quran. So something so small, recite Surah Al Ikhlas three times a day. You're gonna get the reward of reciting the whole Quran. So take advantage of it. So, small stuff like this, your dhikr. Form of the ocean, sins forgiven. Just say subhanallah, akbar, la ilaha, uh, and alhamdulillah 33 times, and then la ilaha one time when you finish, and you're going to have all your sins forgiven. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who did extra good deeds on in the 10 days of Dhul Hajjah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of our good deeds. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us closer to Him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of our sins. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our intentions and make us amongst those who are protected from hellfire and make us amongst those who enter the highest levels of Jannah. Akuli kawli hadha wa astaghfirullah alini wa lakum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr. Inna al-insana lafi khus illa al-lazina amanu wa amilu al-salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Jazakallah khair.